Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the program. Today we're going to do another article regarding genetics, and this one's A, a little bit near and dear to my heart because I am part Korean, and this is a, a Korea-based article, and secondly, it is one of these articles that in which genetics kind of fills in the gaps of, of history, especially the Three Kingdoms period in Korea, that type of history, because a lot of those historical accounts are written a thousand years after the fact by the the literate and the the scholars of of the day specifically the 13th century korea they were so a lot of the information that we have about the three kingdoms period in korea is written about a thousand years later so uh it's nice to see uh genetics come to light and we can kind of fill in the the contextual holes the the conclusions that are that have been come to in this article or arrived at rather in this article. If you look at a map and you and you look at other bits of information, you can kind of come to the conclusion. But this kind of solidifies ex- exactly the, uh, what happened during that time, and you can kind of make the jump from an assumption to as close to a fact as you as you can. They they've done some genetic or facial reconstruction based on these genetics. I really don't know how accurate this could be. Um, I've seen different reconstructions from even more ancient people like Neanderthals and even Homo Denisova and other like Heidelberg man, you know, all these other ancient humans. So you take it with a grain of salt, but I always think it's interesting just to see, and people seem to like it too. <laughs> and they like to argue about it all the time. So anyway, so the article reads 1700 year old Korean genomes show genetic heterogeneity in three kingdoms period of Kaya. Just to give you guys some, uh, before we actually dive deep into this, let's look at the map here. And this is a map of the Three Kingdoms period, a, a portion of it anyway. And you can see here, this is a southern uh, tip of Korea, the peninsula rather. And then here you can see Jindo Island, right? <laughs> uh, named after uh, the Jindo dog, because there are a lot of dogs here that were um, indi- allegedly ad- indigenous to this area. And then that's where the name comes from. And in Japan, in parentheses, it's called Tsushima. And here's another map that I think would be informative. And you can see this, this is Japan, this is Jindo Island right here, and then this is the southern tip of Korea here. And if I were to tell you, just without reading the article, you know, in ancient times, there, the, if you analyze the genetics, there are people here who probably have some Japanese DNA. You probably wouldn't bat an eye, really, because geographically speaking, it makes sense. So that's basically what I was talking about earlier in, in, uh, in this video that you could kind of put two and two together, but the genetics really bear it out and kind of make it almost uh, undeniable. So uh, let's just get, get on with it. An international team led by the University of Vienna and the Ulsan National Institute of Science and Tech in collaboration with the National Museum of Korea has successfully sequenced and studied the whole genome of eight 1,700-year-old individuals dating to the Three Kingdoms period. So it's between 57 BC and 668 AD. So right around the time, the late, like the Roman Empire, like when it transitioned from the Roman Republic to the Roman Empire, right around there, 57 BC is the time of Julius Caesar. So just for people who aren't familiar with this part of history, that, that kind of gives you some context of the time period we're talking. I think most, the bulk of, of uh, uh, the time period is a little bit later than 57 BC. It's more close to like 100, 200 AD when, when we really get into it. The thing about the Gaia Confederacy was that it was more diverse in modern Korea. That's one of the, the main takeaways that they have from here. And, and it's not too far-fetched, right? Especially when you know more about uh, the Kaya history. So uh, a couple notes here. Um, I already mentioned earlier that a lot of the historical accounts of this period were written a thousand years after the fact. So take that with a grain of salt. The economy was largely agricultural and fishing and long-distance trade. So that long distance trade part is, has been fiercely contested because if you guys know anything about the political landscape between uh, Korea and Japan, especially when it comes to st- stuff like archaeology and, and politics, there's always a back and forth as to the extent of Japan's influence over Korea in ancient times. And it's been fiercely debated in, in academic circles <clears throat> pertaining to that period. The conclusion usually is Japan didn't have much of an influence. If you just look at this article in the genetics and the linguistic data, the people of, of the Kaya Confederacy, they, they had a lot of influence linguistically from, from Japonic languages. 
why is that there then if they didn't have some t if there wasn't some kind of uh influence there I i'm not saying that there was a military outpost and that japan had an iron fist or anything like that i don't think anybody's saying that but it is interesting that some of their language permeated that part and we'll get into it later in the video that suddenly their genetics are removed from this area and korea becomes more hetero uh homogenous rather than heterogeneous uh okay i'm bearing the leader like i said earlier ancient koreans from the competitive three were more diverse than present-day korean population so they had eight skeletal remains uh if you guys listened to the last video there were about 168 individuals that were studied in the micronesia uh, video but this one there's there's only eight and they were taken from two different complexes the, the Daesongdong tumuli which is like basically a, a network of tombs and uh the yuhari shell mound which they're both archaeological sites in gimhe south korea so gimhe is is uh in the southeast of uh what is, used to be the Kaya Confederacy. And another big town that you guys may, may know of, uh, Busan, is also in this region as well. A lot of archaeology is actually done in Korea, and a lot of it is done here because of these... Uh, th there's a trove of information here in terms of uh, uh, individuals that are either interred or sacrificed or, or, or makeshift graves. Th there's a lot of them here. So a few takeaways from uh, the study is that genet the genetic differences aren't correlated to the grave typology, indicating that social status was not related to genetic ancestry. And the reason why they, they come up with that, because they observed that there was no genetic difference between the owners and the sacrifices. So that that's pretty interesting. I don't know what historical data there is in, re like in regards to this, but that is a, I thought that was a noteworthy uh, observation here. Uh, six out of eight individuals were genetically closer to modern Koreans, modern Japanese, Kofun Japanese, which are uh, genomes that are contemporaneous with individuals from the study, and Neolithic Koreans. Uh, the genomes of the remaining two were slightly closer to modern Japanese and ancient Japanese Chomons. So two out of the eight were closely related to the to these uh, Chomon people, which were... I don't know if they were the indigenous people because there are also um, there are also other uh, ethnic groups that are more closely related to Caucasoid people rather than the Yayoi uh, East Asian people. Uh, but the Jomans were an ancient precursor, essentially, to that were living at that time, and their you know their genomes show up in in this in this part of the world. So that that again. When you look at a map geographically, it does make it stands to reason that it does make a lot of sense. So there was something going on. There was some interaction happening. So here, so modern Koreans, on the other hand, appear to have lost this Joman-related genetic component owing to relative genetic isolation that followed the Three Kingdoms period. So who knows what happened? Most likely, they were cast out. Maybe uh, they were they were genocided, or they, yeah, or yeah, more than likely, they were probably uh, kicked out of, of the peninsula for some reason or another that I don't know the details of. But genetically speaking, after a certain period, they were kind of removed from that from the gene pool, essentially. And then Korea became uh, more homogenous, genetically speaking. Uh, these results support a well-documented post-Three Kingdoms period Korean history, suggesting that Koreans of the time were intermixing within the peninsula and their genetic differences were diminishing until the Korean population became homogenous. So there is some sort of, during that time then, the, how do you explain the intermixing? Well, politically speaking or economically speaking, you can look at those and even linguistic data. Those are kind of areas that if you were a scholar, you could deep dive into and try to find these correlations and, and compare it or parallel it to the genetic data and it, it would make sense, right? So I guess what I'm trying to say is if there's a lot of trade happening between these these three kingdoms, if, if there's trade, there's interactions, and if there's interactions, there's language uh, melding to some degree. It doesn't even have to be a lingua franca or anything like that. It's just after a few generations of peop two different peop two populations of people interacting, languages, you know, they, they change accordingly. That's just that's just normal and we see it in the genetics so so all that is kind of a parsimonious uh example of how uh, it check how this kind of this intermi this idea of intermixing checks out in all these different subject areas whether it be linguistics economics and, and genetics etc and uh 
another interesting uh, tidbit from this article is uh, a previous article about almost a year ago now uh, was an article from Science Daily, another uh, academic uh, publication, and they and they make a finding where there are tw- where in which they sequ- uh, they they are, there are twelve newly sequenced ancient DNA Japanese genomes which come from the bones of people living in post and pre farming. Uh, periods or pre and post par- farming periods, and they identify a later influx of East Asian ancestry during the Kofun period, which lasted from around 300 to 700 AD, which saw the emergence of political centralization in Japan. So that's very interesting, right? Because C- the Kaya Confederacy ends at around this time, uh, like 532, I think, is the official uh, time period. And you know, if you have a confederacy that ends. And suddenly those people with that genetic marker, in this case, the, the ones with links to Japan, they're suddenly removed. It stands the reason that they probably left and went back to Japan because there is a later influx around this between 300 to 700 AD. And that's right around the time there is a reorganization of, of boundaries in the southern uh, portion of the Korean Peninsula. So it seems like these two, oops, it seems like these two, uh, uh, facts kind of they're consistent with each other right there's japanese uh genetics and in, in in this part of the peninsula and then suddenly they're gone and then another piece of information comes in saying oh well there's an influx of, of east asian ancestry coming into 300 to 700 so there's probably some sort of immigration going on or or maybe it's not even immigration maybe it's just uh people are just fleeing and going back but um, it's anyway. It just seems like a lot of this is linked. If you compare it to historical accounts and and linguistic accounts and all of these other uh, uh, dis- disciplines, then it seems to uh, be. It seems to make sense, and that's why multidisciplinary studies and and teams that that uh, study this are invaluable because there's you can look at it from so many different angles. So uh, anyway, that about does it for this uh, episode. Um, I'm th- one more thing before I leave. Um, I'm thinking about doing a live stream. I'm probably going to schedule it probably a week in advance. I'm thinking every Thursday, probably Thursday nights uh, uh, Pacific. Um, but I'm going to schedule it in advance and see how many people are, are thinking about going. But if not a lot of people are going to watch, then I'll probably uh, hold hold off. But yeah, let me know in the comments what you think about this or about a live stream situation. Um or, you know, anything else you, you, you noticed in this article that I may have missed.